Well, I think it's about time we could get uh, 1600 so we can get this started. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for uh, coming to this deep dive. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the guy who's going to run it, um, General J.D. Thurman. Most of you know his background, but for those that don't, um, he retired as the Commander in Chief for uh, uh, for the United Nations Forces in in uh, Korea. Um, a longtime aviator, but also a, a ground guy. Uh, he's been a huge supporter of Army aviation for several years. In 2003, uh, we selected him to be the the, to run the aviation task force that looked at just the opposite of what we're looking at now. That was how we were going to grow aviation. Now he's, he's uh, involved with uh, the, the study that's going to look at ARI, and uh, he has a group, a panel group here that he'll introduce uh, that will talk about what, what we think the Army will look like after ARI. General Thurman. Well, it's great to be down here with you, and uh, Thanks for coming on in. Come on, there's some chairs up here. If one of these guys falls out or my pacemaker stops, you'll have to get up here and help run this damn thing. <laughs> you know, as I tell everybody, I run off of batteries. I got a dual fade act, so I don't, you know, as long as that thing keeps humming, that we're good to hook. Uh, first off, it's great to, to be here. As a retired guy, you know, I'm a cheerleader. And... Uh, I'm keeping my stuff in my barn down there p with good pre-combat checks because if they call me back, I'm ready to roll. And I get my marksmanship out killing hogs and, uh, and uh, keeping all them predators off my property down there in Texas. But anyway, uh, we're here this afternoon to discuss uh, the future of Army aviation after the Aviation uh, Restructuring Initiative. Now, we're not going to revisit ARI, okay? That's not the purpose of this. This is to talk about the future. And before I get started good, I want to introduce the panel. We got our aviation branch chief, uh, our CG, uh, Major General Mike Lundy. Uh, we've got uh, Brigadier General uh, uh, Troy uh, Koch, uh, who represents... 11th, he's the commander of 11th Aviation, represents the uh, United States Army uh, Reserve. Uh, we've got Brigadier General Frank Muth, Headquarters Department of the Army, G8, Quadrennial Defense Review. And we got Colonel Mark Weiss, Army National Guard, Headquarters Army National Guard uh, uh, Aviation. And Mr. Ellis Golson, who uh, works at Fort Rucker, uh, capabilities integration, combat developments for uh, for General Lundy at Fort Rucker. So uh, the way we're going to run this, I'm going to go through a few charts and uh, to set the context right, and then I have about 10 fundamental questions I think we want to try to get to. And we solicit your input from the audience if something, if you're worried about the future like many of us are, uh, and uh, what we got going on out there today, uh, please, by all means, there's a mic in the, in the center of the floor here, and I just welcome you to uh, come forward. So, I want to set the, uh, the uh, context right of the deep, vi uh, deep dive first by reviewing the state of play. And the real state of play I think, is understanding where we are with our warfighting doctrine. It's great to have a piece of equipment, a brand new piece of equipment, but if you don't know how to use it and how you intend to operate in the future, I got to tell you, it won't get funded. It won't make the cut. Where we've been successful in the United States Army, we've been able to tie capabilities to how we want to fight in the future. And so I'd ask you to think a little bit about this. On this slide, it describes a unifying concept for the future, on, uh, which is on the left side, it talks about airland battle doctrine. Many of us grew up with that. Uh, if you go back and read the 76th version of 100-5, it talked about 
but I think it's about time we could get uh, 1600 so we can get this started. Um, first of all, thanks everybody for uh, coming to this deep dive. Uh, it's my honor to introduce the guy that's going to run it, um, General J.D. Thurman. Most of you know his background, but for those that don't, um, he retired as the Commander in Chief for uh, uh, for the United Nations Forces in in uh, Korea. Um, a longtime aviator, but also a, a ground guy. Uh, he's been a huge supporter of Army aviation for several years. In 2003, uh, we selected him to be the the, to run the aviation task force that looked at just the opposite of what we're looking at now. That was how we were going to grow aviation. Now he's, he's uh, involved with uh, the, the study that's going to look at ARI, and the, he has a group, a panel group here that he'll introduce uh, that will talk about what, what we think the Army will look like after ARI. General Thurman. Well, it's great to be down here with you, and uh, Thanks for coming on in. Come on, there's some chairs up here. If one of these guys falls out or my pacemaker stops, you'll have to get up here and help run this damn thing. <laughs> you know, as I tell everybody, I run off of batteries. I got a dual fade act, so I don't, you know, as long as that thing keeps humming, that we're good to hook. Uh, first off, it's great to, to be here. As a retired guy, you know, I'm a cheerleader. And... Uh, I'm keeping my stuff in my barn down there with good pre-combat checks because if they call me back, I'm ready to roll. And I get my marksmanship out killing hogs and, uh, and uh, keeping all them predators off my property down there in Texas. But anyway, uh, we're here this afternoon to discuss uh, the future of Army aviation after the aviation uh, restructuring initiative. Now, we're not going to revisit ARI, okay? That's not the purpose of this. This is to talk about the future. And before I get started good, I want to introduce the panel. We got our aviation branch chief, uh, our CG, uh, Major General Mike Lundy. Uh, we've got uh, Brigadier General uh, uh, Troy uh, Koch, uh, who represents... The 11th, he's the commander of 11th Aviation, represents the uh, United States Army uh, Reserve. Uh, we've got Brigadier General Frank Muth, Headquarters Department of the Army, G8, Quadrennial Defense Review. And we got Colonel Mark Weiss, Army National Guard, Headquarters Army National Guard uh, uh, Aviation. And Mr. Ellis Golson, who uh, works at Fort Rucker uh, capabilities integration, combat developments for, uh, for General Lundy at Fort Rucker. So uh, the way we're going to run this, I'm going to go through a few charts and uh, to set the context right, and then I have about 10 fundamental questions I think we want to try to get to. And we solicit your input from the audience. If, something's, if you're worried about the future, like many of us are, uh, and uh, what we got going on out there today, uh, please, by all means, there's a mic in the, in the center of the floor here, and I just welcome you to uh, come forward. So, I want to set the, uh, the uh, context right of the deep, vi uh, deep dive first by reviewing the state of play. And the real state of play I think, is understanding where we are with our war fighting doctrine. It's great to have a piece of equipment, a brand new piece of equipment, but if you don't know how to use it and how you intend to operate in the future, I gotta tell you, it won't get funded. It won't make the cut. Where we've been successful in the United States Army, we've been able to tie capabilities to how we want to fight in the future. And so I'd ask you to think a little bit about this. On this slide, it describes a unifying concept for the future, on, uh, which is on the left side, it talks about airland battle doctrine. Many of us grew up with that. Uh, if you go back and read the 76 version of 100-5, it talked about pretty clearly how we wanted to operate 
and then it got revisited again in 1986 uh, for a new version of 100-5, but we had a well-defined enemy. Many of us served in Europe, uh, and uh, I, for one, was in 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment on the east-west German border before the wall went down, and that's what we talked about, well-defined, well-defined, kind of understood the threat, and we developed capabilities off of that that we could defeat the, the, the threat should they attack uh, into Western Europe. Uh, it talked about generating and applying combat power at the operational and tactical levels when you get down and read that doctrine. It was a linear framework. It was designed to synchronize effects and overwhelm the enemy at the decisive point with superior capability. That's what it's designed to do. Now, unified land operations. Let me show you, see a show of hands of folks that's read unified land operations and the new operating concept. Be honest. If you're a professional, get your head in the books. And I got to tell you, you, you have to understand where the Army's going and how it wants to operate and win in a complex environment. This is very important as we move forward into the future. And the reason that you need to read this is you need to be an advocate for the United States Army. Our profession, it's all about the profession of arms. That's what it's about, about being a soldier. And so I just asked you to go take a look at that. 50 pages or so, read it. The vice gave us a tasker this morning and I know General Lundy talks about that with his operational focus as our branch chief. But unified land operations talks about three key points. First, a force capable of deploying and transitioning rapidly into a complex environment. I just sat over and listened to General Wallace in his deep dive panel where he's talking about training for the future. You may not get a chance in the future to go have this great MRX and we do all this stuff because as small as the total force is going to be, assuming that the Budget Control Act, all that craziness goes on, we have got to make sure we have the right levels of readiness and training. This is what the future is going to require of us. It requires it now. Secondly, a force that can develop the situation in close contact, maneuver from multiple locations and domains, integrate partners or allies while operating dispersed. That's what it talks about. And then thirdly, a force capable of presenting multiple dilemmas to the enemy. See, you want the enemy to focus in multiple directions. You want him to worry more than you do. That's what's great about how we operate and what this new operating concept talks about. So, again, I think uh, this is going to be key to the future. Now, I apologize, this is a busy chart, but I think it's an important chart as we set the context for what we want to do this afternoon. And you read this from left to right. So the left side of the chart, it talks about the seven uh, fundamental roles of Army aviation. The seven key things Army aviation must do. And then you've got required capabilities as you move across the top of the slide. Required uh, capabilities uh, that are going to be important for us as a branch for the future. And then as you slide over, you've got near-term capabilities and requirements, which equates to hardware, which is now, and then the next column, 2025, and then beyond 2025. That's what's out there right now that we can see for the future. And these are the key capabilities that feed in if you believe the seven fundamental roles of Army aviation and you believe required capabilities, it will nest into our operating concept, which is on the right. 
And then down in the lower right corner, it talks about the end state, which is the end state of the vision that our CG talked about this morning. And then, obviously, elements of expeditionary maneuver and joint combined operation. Folks, I got to tell you, we got to walk the talk when it comes to expeditionary operations. I was the C-Flick C-3 for set 1003 Victor. Uh, for General Dave McKernan as we brought the force into Kuwait. We are not going to have the luxury in the future to be able to stage a bunch of stuff and get ready to go fight. You're not going to have that. I was just a CG in Korea. That is fight tonight. No kidding, fight tonight. Not next week, not two days from now, tonight. That's what it was about. And that's what General Scaparotti's continuing with today. And that region is still very volatile over there. So we talk about also tenants of Army operations and some of the warfighting challenges, the ability to conduct combined arms maneuver and to be synchronized with the force when you're, train, when, when you're training together. And if you're not focused on combined arms maneuver, I got to tell you, we, we miss out. Because your ground brethren uh, expect that out there. They expect that. So, as we kind of think about this, we talk about winning, uh, and, you know, what does that really mean? What does that mean with aviation? But I think when you look at the, avi at the Army operating concept, aviation nests quite pretty clearly inside that in, inside that concept. So again, I'm giving you a, a homework assignment as a retired guy. Go read that. Go read it. What I found as G3 of the Army, nobody reads anything. They don't read anything. They talk about it. They get on their little iPhone or Blackberry and, and, and use social media and all that. Read what we got out there. It's pretty good. Okay, so on this chart, this talks about some of the complexities that we've got to deal, uh, deal with. We're entering a period of time characterized by radical technology, technological, uh, strategic, and economic change, all of which will add to the complexities of the international environment and, use, and the use of military force. Just turn on the TV and look at the magnitude of problems we've got around the world and what we're dealing with. And I will tell you, the number one requested capability that's going to roll into the Department of the Army is going to be Army Aviation. High demand. And I would submit to you, you're going to see that in the future. So some of the complexities that we talk about today are globalization, demographic change, energy demands, rapid techno uh, technology advancement, and proliferation, climate change, weapons of mass destruction proliferation, budget constraints, and I'll dwell on that a little bit more, and pressure on discretionary spending. Uh, so that's all out there. So if you look at the environments, and this is assuming ARI is going to be implemented in, by 2019. So here's what we're faced with. Uh, budget. You're going to continue to get downward pressure on this budget through 2025. That's what everybody predicts. Everybody's hoping for some miracle in the United States Congress. I don't know if they're going to get that done. We got many requirements for, for spending that's out there in our country. Uh, demographic shifts change spending priorities. We're an 18 division army today, 10 active divisions, eight National Guard divisions. We already know we've got a budget right now on the, on the active side that, and, uh, and reserve component side that lays out a, a uh, 450K army. And then we talk about 350K for the Army National Guard. We talk about 195 for the, for the Army uh, Reserve. 
But when you get into numbers, you need to be talking about capabilities. And, it, and you got to think about tying this back to the operating concept and what's going to be required for the future. The geostrategic environment, which is another one I think that we need to pay attention to. It's changing. It's changing every day. 60% uh, of the world's population is going to live in urban areas. You're going to operate in built-up areas. You're going to operate in megacities. We talk about megacities and what that means. Again, manned and unmanned systems will play a key role, I believe, in the future. Uh, regional instability will continue in the Middle East and South Asia. That's happening. Uh, so you kind of tick these things off. You look at disruptive technologies. Most intrastate conflicts characterized by irregular warfare, terrorism, and insurgency. So you operate in megacities, the desert, and maritime. If you go over to Pacific Command, 50 pre the, the PACOM AOR has 52% of the globe. And the majority of that's covered by tyranny of distance, uh, large water space. And so when you look at what all our services have to be able to operate over, they're dealing with a lot. And aviation always gets to the forefront. Uh, technologies, unmanned systems. You know, when I was division commander, I used to go in my talk in Baghdad, and everybody is enamored in there watching the TV screen. Well, I'd say, what priority intelligence requirement are you looking at for me to help me out? Sir, I hadn't thought about that. Well, you better get to thinking, because this is about focus and reconnaissance. And that's what you do when you have well-defined priority intelligence requirements. That, and, and when you look at demands out there today, everybody wants a UAV in their back pocket. And so you, what kind of systems are these going to be? How large is the footprint? When General Schoomaker asked me to look at uh, Army Aviation in 2003, he gave me a well-defined task. J.D., go make combi uh, Army aviation more combined arms capable. Optimize it for the joint war fight, shorten the logistics tail. So that ties back in on those other charts about uh, logistics. Uh, breakthroughs in degraded visual environment technology. What's that going to look like? Imagine what that's going to be, conditions-based maintenance. You know, if we're going to have budgets that are going to be reduced to the levels that we think, <clears throat> you can't spend 70% of your budget on ONS, operations and sustainment. So conditions-based maintenance and the ability to, to make parts on, on site and fix forward and change what you need. We got to make these concepts come alive. And it's got, to, it's got to meet the requirement. You go talk to a division commander today, they will tell you that the thing that eats them alive is, is going to be in maintenance. It eats up their budget. So we got to be smart when we move to the future here and continue to do this uh, business uh, right, I believe. Network interoperability. Everywhere I have been, there has been an integration or an interoperability problem. And getting that right. We got to get that right and don't forget the ground man or ground gal that's out there operating. Because if you can't talk to your ground folks, then you're gonna be hard pressed. And, and as you take it up from tactical to the operational level, it's going to be more critical in the future, I believe, than it ever has been. Uh, and there's some other things on there. Automation of air traffic systems drives down manning, training, 
equipping and structure? Do you have to have that in the future? Think about it. What's, what's doable out there? And then uh, lastly, our modernization efforts. Uh, going to four systems. Uh, AH-64, CH-47, UH-60, and uh, the LUH-72. That's what's going to be. This is assuming ARI is implemented. And I hadn't got into fixed wing on this. And then ITEP is underway. Can we sustain that? to upgrade these engines? Do we upgrade all these engines? Is the budget going to be there? And then uh, FVL, uh, future vertical lift. You know, it's around the corner. It's a, it, is, is it essential? Do we need to have a future vertical lift aircraft for every one-for-one uh, -one exchange? Uh, does it have the required capabilities that we got to have in the in the future, such as operation to meet operational reach requirements, speed, range, uh, those sorts of questions. And then, can we put capability ahead of capacity? Can we have both? Can we afford both? So what I did was with this great panel here is I'm going to uh, I've got ten fundamental questions. And we're, we're, we're going to ask the question here up front, and I'd solicit your input from the audience, is one, how does Army aviation nest within the Army's operating concept now and into the future? Is it properly sized? Does it have the right force mix? And when I say force mix, do we have the right balance with the reserve components? between the active, the Army National Guard, Army Reserve. Is the balance right? Are there missions of what I just laid down in here that we perhaps hadn't thought about? I know the homeland is a big deal. The protection of the homeland and the responsibilities that our, our National Guard formations have to our governors and to the American people. So with that, I would open that first question up and then trail with what are the desired operational capabilities for the future, and the future I'm defining is the next 30 years. So with that, I'm going to turn to my panel, and I'm going to ask uh, Major General Lundy here to comment on those first two questions. Well, thanks, sir. The, um, you know, as we think about the future, you know, there's some hard decisions the Army has to make, and really some... You know, what are the big, the big decisions that we have to make that, uh, that drive us towards future force structure and capabilities? And, and there's some big questions to ask. Uh, you know, as I've talked to General Perkins, what, what are the few big questions you can ask that really drive you to making some decisions? So one the Army's got to wrestle with is how big is the squad? And what capability do we want in the squad? Because I would tell you that not only sizes what aviation looks like, but it sizes what our ground vehicles look like. And so as we, as we think to this future, um, certainly it's going to be what kind of capabilities that we want at the lowest tactical level that will drive uh, our, formational, our formation structures and certainly our material solutions that are out there. Um, and really, what, what is the force for? And do we need to have, do we need to take a balanced approach uh, between all three of the components? Do we need to have niche capabilities that are existing in the components? Um, or do we have to have, you know, commonality? Another really hard question that we've got to be able to ask. And as we think about, you know, being under future budget pressure. So I would say that as we look at the Army operating concept, it can't be realized without Army aviation. So to answer the first question, um, I think it's very clear if you read through the Army operating concept, aviation is a key component of that. And then how much joint interdependence is there going to be? And there's two ways to look at the joint interdependence question. Is one, how are we tied into the joint force, our capabilities to communicate with the joint force, operate with the joint force? But then the question is, how reliant do we have to be on the joint force and our partners as well? Uh, those, are, those are very good questions to ask as well. You think about how NATO has tried to solve some of the problems with some countries having a certain capability, whether it's going to be 
a mine sweeper capability or an armor capability or a rotary wing capability, or do we need to have balance across all of those? And then how dependent are we going to have to be, because again, this will drive material solutions and how we train, how dependent are we going to have to be on strategic lift? Do we want to break um, that requirement or at least reduce that requirement uh, inside the joint force? So I think those are instructive things that we need to wrestle with as a community because that's going to drive certainly range and speed uh, of our aircraft. If we're going to remain dependent upon um, strategic lift, whether it's air or sea, if we're going to be re reliant on sea basing, then that changes how we build the vehicles and what the vehicles do. Or if we're going to have to rely on ourselves to be able to get to the fight ourselves, um, then that's going to change the size capabilities uh, and that. I think as we look to the future, that's what JMR is going to help us understand is what the technology is capable of and help us inform how much joint interdependence we're going to need from a deployability and expeditionary capability. If we see some advanced technologies out there that allow us to get much better range uh, than we currently have today, that could be good news for the Air Force that they could reduce some of their requirements potentially and enable us uh, to be able to get to the fight with less dependence. But I'm not sure I see that right now, and I think we're going to continue to have to be joint uh, interdependent. So again, a key piece of this is not only what capabilities we bring, but how do we keep our sister services providing the capabilities that they need, that we need for us to be able to get to the fight uh, in the future. And as we think to our multinational partners, and we get after training right now, it's not so much that they don't have rotary wing aircraft, because a lot of, a lot of nations do, but it's a mission command perspective. So. Again, as we build multinational interdependence, where does our focus need to be on helping our partners realize you know, that we fight at the brigade and the battalion level and to help them be able to bring that kind of capability into the force? Or do we look at them augmenting us uh, as that mission command node? So I think, think some of those, those are some of the bigger things that we can, uh, we can have some conversations about today. And I'll, uh, I'll yield right. to the yeah. next one uh, here for okay. any comments. Yeah, let's answer the question now. I'm, uh, I'm Mark Weiss. I'm the Chief of Guard Aviation. I have the distinct privilege and uh, the honor of uh, working with uh, 26, uh, correction, 31,000 Army National Guard citizen soldiers, your Army National Guard. Four deployed geographically dispersed across all 54 states, territories in the district. That's not going to change regardless of where we are or where we'll end up with ARI. 107 different locations, airfields, heliports, flight facilities, supporting their, their communities on a daily basis. Last year they flew over 250,000 hours, rotary wing, fixed wing. That's not going to change post ARI. So we're, we're the connective tissue between the our, our states, our territories, and our, our, uh, our, our communities. And, and, and our responsibility, regardless of budgets, regardless of where we're at in the R4 gen, is to be able to respond and not be late, late to, to point of need for our citizens, for your citizens, for our, our countrymen. That's not going to change ARI. We're going to have about 1,400 helicopters and fixed-wing aircraft, primarily in the uh, assault, lift, and, and fixed wing. That's not going to change post ARI. That will be a result of ARI. So are we, are we do we have a balance? Are we, is there uh, sufficient capabilities? Because capability will drive doctrine, and doctrine obviously will drive how we fight or our requirements. It will inform our requirements. So are we nested there? Uh, some of the things that concern us right now that we need to get after, as well as in the future, is civil band radios. We've got UH-60 mics and CH-47s, tremendous capability, awesome capability. However, we don't have a push-to-talk release to listen to our first responders on the ground. We've got to fix that, and we can't wait till 2030 or 2045 to get after that, because then we become a hazard as we're trying to put out floods, fires, hurricanes, and tornadoes. So, so the, your Army National Guard, and, and of course, I'm, I'm, I'm the biggest cheerleader, and I'll, I'll be quiet, but your Army National Guard is going to be ready and relevant regardless of where we're at with ARI. One, one thing on the, the question about 
how does aviation integrate into the concept for the future? We have the AOC, and part of the challenge that we have is the, the task to us now is to write warfighting functional concepts that support that AOC. How, how is infantry, armor, aviation, fires, uh, intel going to support it? So all that work is on, going on right now. The challenge we have, though, and what I see as I work those concepts, is that aviation is not a function. Aviation, but aviation supports every function. Every functional concept that comes to my guys or comes to me has a demand for aviation in order to execute the Army operating concept. They can't get it done. They can't cover the battle space. They can't do their task without having aviation in support. So that is where we're going to tie in is through those concepts and being able to integrate with and help those functions uh, be executed. So Frank Muth, for those of you who don't know me, and sir, thanks for having me today come and sit in this august group on this panel. Um, so people say, hey, what do you do with the QDR office? Well, the QDR was turned in last summer, so why'd they bring you in, right? And I'm like, I don't know, I haven't figured it out yet. But uh, so I'm really working in budget. I'm working with the commission, and we can talk about that. It'll be a little bit later. And, and also, uh, the Chief's got me working on some different tasks uh, on uh, things that we're dealing with, you know, global, what we're calling the velocity of global instability and everything that's going on in the world and the demand on the Army right now. Um, but getting back to the question, I'm, what I want to do is the future, you know, aviation integration into the future. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie that into what I deal with, with the budget. So if you guys know right now, Palm 1721 is being built. That's the Palm that's being built right now, and they're starting to do some of the, what we call the, I just call it snap the chalk line. They start making some choices of where different programs out there may have to be cut. You guys got to understand there's seven big divisions in the equipping modernization world, and out of those seven, three of them pull in the most money. It's aviation, ground combat vehicle, and communications, all right? Now, what's been paying the bill for the last couple years has really been coming out of the ground combat vehicle. All right, and that's been keeping aviation, and especially WIN-T and the Inc. series and the capability sets for our communication and mission command. So they've been paying the bill out of the ground combat vehicle. They're going to start leveling that out a little bit. So we may feel a little bit of that pain, but we're working through that, and we've got some strong leaders up there taking care of that. But still, understand that how you create a balanced approach to budget and that you don't have a hollow army, it's focused on manning, equipping, and training. All right, and what's been paying the bill for the last five years since we entered this has been the equipment. We started at uh, in 11, when I first kind of got my smattering of, of uh, budget knowledge, which is still very small, uh, at about $27 billion to equip the Army or modernize the Army. We're down to about $20 billion worth of buying power. That's a lot, that is a lot to drop in four years. Now, the question comes back, and how do I roll that in? And we can talk about budget later, but aviation, integration into the future. Do you not think in 1970, 72, 73, 74, as the Vietnam was winding down, we were starting to bring down our force size, that we weren't under huge budget pressure? If you remember, if you bought a house back then, I think the interest rate was 19%. Um, the budgets were, we were getting cut across the board. Somebody had the vision. Somebody had the, the strength, the moxie, to push through the big five. All right, 20 years later, we have those ready to go to a fight in 1990. And it made a difference on the battlefield. I, I, I challenge anybody that said that it didn't. Today, we're in the same boat. Our budgets are coming down. We've got to have the strength to look to the future, look to aviation and what it can do on the battlefield because of the velocity of global instability and know that our future is both in the ITEP and what we can put back into these great aircraft that we have in our fleet, but also FBL. And we've got to stay the course, and we've got, to, we've got to make sure that we keep that money there. We keep our focus, an eye on that target, laser focus, and make sure that we follow through. Because that's how we integrate Army aviation into the future. Thank you, Frank. Uh, General Troy Koch, Commander 11th Aviation. And, uh, and one of the things I was thinking as, we're, uh, as our, our panel members are talking is, is how do we make our force more effective? How do, we, uh, how do we integrate our forces to make them more effective, more efficient, and more cost-effective? 
And some of the things we're doing in, in the Army Reserve, and I know in the Army National Guard, is the integration of our forces so that we're not um, counteracting one another, um, tying into not just, again, when I look at my, my Army National Guard brethren um, and what they do, they're the first responders within the state. They're not the only ones within the state to meet a national disaster or uh, to meet a, uh, an oncoming issue. And so what we're trying to do uh, in the Army Reserve is to tie in uh, with those National Guard uh, emergency response centers. Uh, we also do that through DSERF and, um, and, and working together in a team uh, both with Army National Guard and active component. Um, and how we do that is we do that together. And in, until we change I think the way that we've been doing business with each and every component doing things separately and we start integrating together as a collective force uh, which we are moving more towards uh, and we've got a long ways to go. Um, I think another aspect that I would look at is uh, in the future is, is how do we uh, manage our force uh, to, in, to ensure that uh, we, we set up our forces for professional development, career development correctly. Uh, one of the things we're doing in Army Reserve Aviation is, is we're, we're moving away from detachments, uh, consolidating our, into companies. Uh, we're also consolidating our assets more in a geographical center uh, so that we can, we can benefit and leverage off of those expertise and that we don't, we don't lose our expertise. One of the great strengths that the Army Reserve brings to the fight is that we retain knowledge. That knowledge moves from the active component, moves into the reserve component, and then can be reutilized when our country needs it. Sir. Okay, so any comments to the panel or any questions on what they've said uh, thus far? Okay. So my next key question is, what is the right mix of aviation capabilities for the total force? To do what we said we need to be able to do with the operating concept, to meet the vision that I display. What do we believe that right mix is force structure wise? See, if a budget is, is going to drive what we're doing, we got to first determine what's important as an army on how we want to fight because it can't really be about how many new platforms we're buying. It's got to be what is the right mix. What And then you get into affordability. Then you get into maintaining relevance as a joint partner. Because as you kind of look around the globe here, when something happens, it happens fast. And when you get the call, you got to be ready to go. And you say, okay, let me dial up some more strategic lift. I think we got, we got 228 C-17s right now. That's what we got. And C-5, if it'll fly, <laughs> then you get to looking around at Sea lift, how much sea lift has been reduced. So we're going to be dealing with some constraints. First off, what I've learned, you're never going to be 100%. If you think you're going to be 100%, you're not. So with that, I would ask that question that I just posed. Right so I, mix. So I, I think the, um, you know, as we think about the mix, instead of, you know, talking about wiring diagrams and what units look like, I think if we, if we take a capabilities approach. So... There are going to be capabilities that we need at times and we don't need them at other times. And there's going to be a density of capabilities that we have to have. So as we think to strategic deployment capabilities, you know, one of the things that one of the questions we're asking industry and as we look at JMR and future capabilities is, you know, do we have the capability to have an applique that allows an aircraft to fly faster and farther 
but it may not perform at the X. If you remember this morning, I talked about the you know the performance of the X can't be trade space. So when we're doing actions on contact, actions in the objective, we need the aircraft, we need the vehicles to perform better than what they will do today. Uh, but you've always got trade space. You have to you have to trade maybe agility for range or speed for range. So can we have capabilities that allow us to achieve a certain effect, whether it's a deployment, you know, a strategic deployment, and then, you know, the aircraft, you change them, uh, they're adaptable, and they're better at the X once they're in the, uh, in the operational area. So that's certainly going to help us think about how we shape the structures that were out there. Tough questions about certain missions. Do we need future vertical lift? Do we need the speed and range for every mission? Or are there certain missions that it's okay to not buy that speed and range because speed and range is going to cost. So we've got to make tough decisions about that. What's the right mix of uh, those particular capabilities? I think the, um, from a modular perspective, you know, we're modular today, we're multi-compo today. Our doctrine clearly acknowledges we're not going to deploy really by component, that we're going to be reliant regardless of whether you look at Army aviation or you look at, you know, the Army in general, for that matter, the joint force. We've got capabilities in each one of the components that we're going to need on every deployment. So I think in the future, uh, I don't see that changing. I mean, I think any time we're going to have to go to the fight, we're going to have to do it with all three compos. And so we need to think about our structure from that perspective. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't look alike, but maybe there's, maybe there's not a consistency for the whole compo. Maybe not all Compo 1 looks the same, all Compo 2 looks the same, all Compo 3, but a band of Compo 1, 2, and 3 look the same, a band of Compo 1, 2, and 3 look different. So those are things we have to think about. And then you've got to balance it against ongoing force requirements, ongoing requirements out there in the combatant commands um, as we think about structure. So, you know, I frequently get asked the question, why don't we have aviation task forces pre-organized? And I say, okay, well, what does that look like? Tell me how that fits. Is it one assault company, one attack company, one Chinook platoon, whatever. But you can't put that on the map anywhere because every task force we've had out there has been tailored for the mission. So I think as we think, as, think of our future structure, it has to be this very tailorable, adaptable, modular structure. I think that's what we've learned over the last 13 or 14 years, that that modularity, that, that, adaptive, or that, that interdependence that we gain, I think that's the right approach and allows us to really think about how we structure our formations, then you just have to figure out how much of it you need um, and, and how you do it, whether it's cross-banding between compos or isolating compos. You know, those are, those are tough questions that we've got to ask uh, as we move to the future. Over. Thanks. Just one other uh, item to kind of go along with what General Lundy was saying. General Perkins, when he briefs the AOC, says that the future is unknown and unknowable. We've, we've tried to predict it all these years. Uh, everybody's tried to have a crystal ball, and we've never gotten it right. So the question is, if it's the, what is the right mix, it depends. It depends on who it is we're going to go fight and what capabilities they have and where they are, et cetera. So the challenge is we have to have a range of capabilities, just like General Lundy said, and then once we figure out what the right mix is, we've got to be able to rapidly jump on that and expand it. So that requires us to get with our industry partners and them be able to keep a capability to react as well. Uh, the other thing is we have to, as we talk about the, the right force, talk about capabilities versus things. It's very easy to talk about things in a uh, situation such as this. Difference being, a shadow air vehicle, UAS, is a thing. The capability that it brings is surveillance and the ability to do reconnaissance over expanded distance. So let's talk about the capability we want to have in the end state, and then we can figure out what things and how many of those things and combinations we need to have to produce a capability. So uh, I, I just say ditto, you know, ditto to the chief, ditto to uh, to Mr. Golson. Uh, we we ought to, and I think we'll be forced to think compo six, one, two, and three. Uh, we 
com or the, the compo two and three, the reserve component, we are that strategic depth, that, that hedge. We are that, that good investment for the nation. Um, but uh, as we move forward, as we have been in the past, we, we absolutely must be thinking compo six, compo one, two, and three, integrating those capabilities, regardless of where compo, what, what, regardless what compo it sits in, and then develop those relationships as we move forward. I'm gonna take Ellis, Ellis, what he brought up and just add a little bit to it, especially when you think of the AOC. So there's two kind of lines that come out of the AOC that really jump out at me and it kind of ties in what General Lundy say and what Ellis said. One is, you know, the Army is the foundation of the Joint Force, so think about it. So if we go anywhere in any type of land operation, the Army's gotta be there you know, to bring everybody together, because we, we got, the, you know, we got all that foundational uh, logistic support that the other services don't have, and that, and that also includes, of course, aviation. Uh, to add to what uh, Ellis said, it's unknown, unknowing, and constantly changing. So those are the three words you got to pull out of the AOC, and so that gets back to what uh, General Lundy was saying: is man, you got to be scalable, tailorable, and you've got to be able to adjust and adapt to the changing situation, to the constantly changing requirement and mission, and that, when we look in the future, we look at capability requirements, and then we look at the demand signals, then we gotta figure out the force that can meet the mission and the COCOM commander's requirements, um, but tonight, and that gets back to um, what General Thurman was saying, you gotta be ready to fight tonight, so bringing that all together. One of the things, you know, as I, I think, uh, and we've been through multi-discussions on this is, you know, multi-compo means different things to, to different people, depending on you, based off your experience, based off of uh, your background, based off of where you've come. And I think one of the things that I've, I've learned uh, from a joint environment is uh, there are different ways of doing multi-compo. So do we look at building block units into multi-compo, or do we look at building compos into multi-compo units, depending on their strengths and how we leverage what they can bring to the table? Um, in saying that, I, I think that there are, are different ways that we can move forward uh, in the future, leveraging all three components. And when we talk about multi or compo six, um, I think we also need to look at what each component brings to the fight and how do we utilize that to benefit each one of our strengths. And with that. One, one, one additional thing to add, I mean, it, you know, thinking unconventionally about how we, how we do things. So let's, let's think about acquisition. So as we develop a requirement, Let's say if it's an aircraft survivability requirement. You know, one of the things that we look at is, you know, we have a BOI basis of issue that, you know, we've got to put one of these on every aircraft. And some of these, some material solutions take a lot of developmental effort. They take a lot of S&T. They take a lot of RDT&E money and a lot of investment by, um, you know, the, the companies that are building things for us. You know, as we approach, you know, future requirements for us to be agile, you know, do we buy capacity? Not necessarily buy things, but do we buy capacity? And what I mean by that is do we get a solution and do we get enough of a solution that we can enter early with it and we buy capacity cheaper than buying quantity, but we buy capacity to where there's an expectation that given an amount of time that that, that capability is going to be able to be produced. Because to stay agile in just the aircraft survivability world right now, it's very expensive. And for us to upgrade and modify every single aircraft is unaffordable. So we have to think about different models in the future, and we're gonna have to have different acquisition and contracting strategies, I think, to be able to meet this very complex world. So if I need a solution for a particular missile, it needs to be developed. It takes a long time to develop it. But then if I have to buy quantity, you know, buy a number of aircraft, instead, maybe cheaper, buy capacity, that there's an expectation that there's an industrial base there that could produce something very quickly so I can equip it because when we get in a time of war, obviously there's going to be resources that will come with that. We'll have to make a resourcing decision. So those are some of the things that we need to think about as far as structure. Uh, that are not just wiring diagrams out there, but it's what capabilities do we have in the force? How much do we need to enter early to do the day-to-day -day business? And then what kind of capacity do we have out there? 
There's some things you can buy off the shelf. You know, we can buy tools off the shelf today. It doesn't take a big developmental effort to build a wrench. It already exists. But I would tell you to build an aircraft survivability solution takes a lot of effort, but they're very expensive to put on a lot of aircraft. So do we think differently in the acquisition world? And these are, these are things we're gonna, have to, we're gonna have to break some of the thought processes that we have as we go to the future because we're gonna be under budget pressure. We're only gonna have a limited number of resources, but we need some of these capabilities. So we buy enough of the capability to, um, to do the early business that we need to do and we buy the capacity to be able to bring the follow-on capability after that. I think that's an area that we need to do some exploration on uh, and do some thought on, and that's something that we can talk with industry about on whether that's a viable way to approach some of these fiscal challenges that we've got. Over. Okay. Uh, so as we kind of think about this and we go back and we say we've got to have a force capable of deploying and transitioning rapidly into a complex environment. And you can define that multiple ways. It gets into leader development. Because uh, to be able to do something and take a system and make it relevant to the practical application of the war fight is something we can't lose sight of. We just can't lose sight of that. And so the adjustments that we need to make in the future, I would just say when it comes to force structure, maybe we have to look at what we, how we really want to be organized uh, with, with inside those formations. So are they interchangeable? Are they interoperable and can we integrate rapidly? Those are some of the key things that I see that I think you're going to be challenged with. The last one that, uh, that I'd like to ask is, is uh, are we comfortable with where we are with the right mix between manned and unmanned systems? And do, how do we see that changing for the future? when it comes to manned and unmanned systems. Because again, it might, everybody loves a UAV. They're everywhere. I had one fly over my property down in Texas the other day. And it's amazing what's going on out there, just in the civilian world. And we talked a little bit about that on the chart, so I would just ask you guys, what, what do we really think about manned and unmanned systems? Well, I think one we've we've got to, um, you know, we've got some limitations with our unmanned systems right now. I mean, we're dependent upon airfields. So, one, we've got to get away from airfields. Two, the survivability is suspect in uh, an integrated air defense. So, I think that's another key area as we look to future requirements for unmanned systems. And I talked a little bit earlier today about you know, man does not mean or unmanned does not mean unmanned, and that's very true. The formations. The, the, the tail that comes with unmanned systems, the more complex unmanned systems, is too big, and we can't afford to um, consume that much tail in the future. So we've got to work hard on how we reduce um, the structure that goes with those formations. But I think unmanned systems are going to continue to remain a part, but do we move beyond uh, just the the tether that we have right now to where there's going to be a level of interoperability, and are they, in fact, going to maneuver with manned systems? Are we gonna have unmanned wingmen? Which I think is something that we're looking at very hard on the ground and I think it's something we've gotta look at on the air, in the air side. Uh, and what's the role that they play uh, in future capabilities? Because the, as we think about uh, the complexity of the environment that we operate in, uh, the threats that are gonna be out there, the unmanned systems can provide us a tremendous amount of capability that reduces the risk for the manned force. But we also can't sit there and, and think that we're going to have unmanned systems that we're going to have soldiers climbing in the back of. I don't think culturally we're going to be ready for that in 2030. I'm not sure any of us would sign up for that. Um, so we need to be careful about thinking that unmanned is going to be a panacea because if we're going to have soldiers that we're going to put on the ground, you know, from an air ground team perspective, we don't want to have just the visual, you know, flat mic up there in the front um, who's not flying the aircraft. 
uh, and have soldiers piling in the back of that. So I think, you know, manned systems are going to continue to be uh, a part of what we're doing from both air assault and, uh, and attack and reconnaissance. And I also think that as we, you know, think about medevac, and there's a lot of discussion about whether we need to do medevac operations. You know, in route care is what makes our medevac unique in the world. And so you've got to have a manned platform to be able to do that. Are there places where unmanned systems are viable? Absolutely. But the force structure that we've got right now and the number of missions that we have for our manned platforms, there's not space to add more unmanned in there. We start trading away capabilities that we have to have. So unless we look for additional force structure or we can reduce the structure requirements that we have right now for the unmanned systems, we're probably at about our apex of how much we're going to be able to put inside the branch. So the trade space is we've got to make the unmanned systems and the manned formations smaller in people numbers. That means reducing the tail if we're going to put more teeth out there. Uh, if we can't do that, then there's no growth left in our formations right now. And I think there's viable missions on both sides from a manned and unmanned perspective. And there's some that, you know, manned are going to be better and unmanned are going to be better in other areas. So kind of my take right now on where we're at on manned and unmanned. All right. Okay. Anybody else? I just want to add that, you know, with the uh, ARS is now standing up, uh, we've been doing it. We've had a, uh, the UASs in our formations for a couple years, but it's, let's face it, it's been a little ad hoc because some of the, you know, the Gray Eagles were put under the brigade, some were put down in the attack battalions, you know, and then occasionally we had guys that were working with the BCTs and they kind of oversaw, you know, the, the, the shadows. And I mean, we were, it, it wasn't set in stone, it wasn't in the formation, it wasn't part of the TONE, they weren't part of the chain of command. I mean, completely like the ARS is. So my point is this, I think we're really on the cusp to be able to answer that question because once we stand up the ARSs, we get the fully, the doctrine kind of vetted out, the TTPs, because we got the doctrine and we're really kind of starting it, but the TTPs will really tell of where we can take this capability. And then you get level four type of uh, uh, UAS type of compatibility, that is gonna change the dynamics because you know it's the, it's the dynamics of those people working together, uh, the, the CAV troopers working together uh, both UAS operators and the pilots and living together and kind of getting what they want out there on the battlefield together, uh, that is really going to pull that true capability of what it really means. So that will help, I think, inform what our future formations and our future capability and requirements needs will be down the, down the road. Just a couple of things. As we start to look at manned and unmanned teaming, technology is going to bring us a lot of stuff. It's stuff that's available today that we're going to put together in, in new combinations. Autonomy. Google just drove a car across the United States without a driver. Okay? So autonomy in the air is not that far away, just like the CG was saying, maneuvering with aviation forces. The uh, next step as we continue, the, the ground guys are developing their unmanned systems. So it's not very far to say that we're going to have unmanned, unmanned teaming, where we have ground robots sharing information with aerial robots that have a layer, layer of autonomy, uh, and then uh, passing that information to another system. We have the capability today for a Gray Eagle to talk straight to AFA TADS and it develop a fire solution and just wait for somebody to push a button. So as you start to look 10 years down the road, that could change the nature of war fighting significantly. However, what the AOC says is we are going to build capabilities to win, not capabilities to fight. When you, you can fight with man and unmanned teaming, but you may not win the conflict because the people can't interact with a robot. You cannot forget about the human nature of conflict and the face-to-face -face interaction that occurs when you have a soldier look somebody else in the eye. So uh, the CG had us read a book called Leaders Eat Last. Robots always do what they are programmed to do. Humans don't. And sometimes you don't need to do what you're programmed to do in order to do the right thing. So let's don't lose sight of the human nature. Over. Okay, we had an hour to do this and we could 
probably go on forever uh, because I think what we've been able to do, and I first want to thank the panel for their time to give you all something to think about as we move forward. Because uh, for sure, our adversaries, they're out there thinking too, and they read our stuff. And so hopefully we've given you a few ideas to, to ponder and think about the future. Because as we're uh, you know, going round and round about budgets, it's the future that's going to matter for our children. It's the future that's going to matter of defending this country and defending our values. So with that, uh, hopefully we've given you something, and I thank you for your attention, and, and, uh, and that's what I've got uh, over to you there, uh, EJ.